Hello there. These are your parts of an experiment number two and also measurement notes. Please follow along, listen, be writing in when we get to a blank, and use these again to study for the upcoming assignments and assessments. Here we go. Scientists, as you have learned, begin experimenting with something called a well-defined question. And you've learned and um, practiced what a well-defined question is, but we are also going to refresh your memory here. A well-defined question, or a WDQ, is, has to have a couple of things. It's testable. So it has to be something you can perform a test about to find your answers. And it will include your independent and dependent variables. So it will include both what you're testing and what you're measuring from your test. So for an example, a well-defined question would be right here. Which type of grease helps a bicycle chain move the smoothest over time? So it includes um, the independent variable, which would be different types of bicycle chain grease, and you would be measuring the smoothest over time of your bicycle chain. And it's something you could test. And moving on with the experiment, after you have a well-defined question and you're going to test it, you'll, before you actually do the experiment, you will make a hypothesis. H-Y-P-O-T-H-E-S-I-S. -S. Hypothesis is made making a prediction. as to what will happen in your experiment. You would make a, a prediction what you think would happen. So in this case, you'd make a prediction about which of the types of bike chain grease would be more in the smoothest on your bicycle. And also, with the hypothesis, if written correctly, it will include your independent dependent variables, just like your well-defined question does, but it can also be written as an if-then statement. Once you get into um, upper, you know, middle school and other upper level sciences, instead of writing a prediction as I think or we think, it is more higher level and more accepted if you write an if then statement, such as what's coming up. Example, if grease number two is used on the bike chain, it will move smoothly for over six months. So um, you have your if and then your, your then And this is your independent variable. You're trying out different greases, and then you're measuring how smoothly it will go over a six-month time period. That's your dependent variable. I should put the word then in there. <laughs> if it is used on the bike chain, then we can add the word then. Then it will move smoothly for over six months. <laughs> Sorry about that. Next. After you've made your well-defined question and you've made a hypothesis, you don't test just yet. You have to have some very detailed steps, step-by-step -step plan, and these are your procedures. Write that in. Procedures. The procedures are written out next to include a thoroughly detailed plan to test the hypothesis. To test the hypothesis. And when I say thoroughly detailed, it needs to be where anyone can follow what you want them to do, as in tell them what equipment you're using, what to do first, what safety equipment you need, and um, how to wrap up everything, clean up. It's very detailed. Lots of steps typically in an experiment. Um, and as a refresher, again, it doesn't hurt us to hear this again, to practice it again, as independent and dependent variables of an experiment. So in the independent variable, it is what you are testing. What exactly are you testing? That is the independent variable. It's the one variable you change. It's the one variable change. So the thing that you are testing is what you're changing to see which one is best for the experiment. 
It also has another name. It is known as the manipulated. M-A-N-I-P-U-L-A-T-E-D. Manipulated variable. Manipulate means to change, to be in control of. So you are in control of changing that one thing you're testing. So independent variables, the manipulative variable. An example would be the different types of chain grease that you would be using in this experiment. The dependent variable, it is what you are measuring. What you are measuring in your experiment. It is also known as, the, its other name is the responding variable. Responding, because it will respond to your manipulative variable, to your independent variable. It's what's going to um, make changes, what's gonna be showing you the effects. So it's what you can measure. So the example here is how long the bike chain grease moves the chain smoothly. However long it keeps that bike chain moving smoothly is what you're measuring when, by changing the different types of bike chain grease. Okay, so we've been practicing with independent and dependent variable. Now there's other things to involve in your experiment to know and identify them as a scientist is the control group and your constants. Okay, so the control group, that's the part of the experiment that serves as the standard of comparison. This is your baseline data. You have to have a foundation. So baseline data data is your control group. You have to have something to compare your manipulated or independent variable to. So next bullet, it is what your object is normally, normally supposed to do or what it's normally supposed to look like. It's just going through its everyday kind of life. Next thing is it will go through the experiment. It will go actually go through the experiment, but will not, will not get the independent variable. It will not get the independent variable. It will go through the experiment. So for instance, like your control group could be a bike chain without any grease on it and see how long it goes, runs smoothly without any grease. So um, that would be your control group. It's where you get your baseline data from, is in your control group. The next section um, are our constants. It's typically plural, so I'm gonna add an S right there. It's our constants. So our constants are, the constant group anyways, they're the factors that are kept the same. All the factors in your experiment that you're keeping the same because you're not testing them. It is, um, and not the constants are not allowed to change to make sure the data collected is valid and reliable. We want valuable, and I'm underlining those words, or you can highlight them, but um, we want um, data to be reliable, to you know, to be the best kind of data we can get, um, very true data from our experiment. We don't want anything to. Um, inhibit the variable. We only want one variable, one thing to change. So we'll keep everything else the same. And we'll do some examples to kind of get this straight. The constants are not what you are testing. They are not what you are testing. For example, um, if you're not testing these things, they're what you're going to keep the same in all your different trials. You're going to keep maybe the temperature the same, the time you're using it the same, type of objects, the amounts that you're using are going to be the same. So like if you're testing different types of bike chain grease, you're going to use the same type of bike. Those are, here's some constants, the same type of bike. You're going to use it the same amount of time each time. You're going to measure it for the same amount of months. You're going to, um, use, um, the same, yeah, the same time of day, same, same amount of grease. So those are your constants, things that are, you're not testing the experiment. You want to make sure they're all the same um, in all of your trials. So let's practice um, these different parts of an experiment with 
Um, we have the well-defined questions, but also including your independent dependent variable, your constants, your control group. So let's do a couple of examples together just so you can get some more practice. And plants are one thing that's super easy to um, depict all those parts of an experiment. So let's do that with this example number one. Which type of water will improve plant growth? So we have a testable question. We have an independent dependent variable, which we're going to pick out of that in just a minute. Um, so I'm gonna do that first at the bottom. Let's pick out the independent dependent variable. So in this situation, you have five different um, types of water you're testing on the plant. So the independent variable is, because you're wanting to know which type of water, that's what you're testing. That's what you wanna find out. So let's change the type of water. So that's exactly what will be our independent variable. It's type of water, because that is what we're testing. That's our independent variable. And um, what are we going to measure because we're changing the type of water? We want to test um, the improvement of plant growth. So we can do that in two words. We're going to measure plant growth. So the different types of water we have are, um, we have tap water, which is just the normal plain water we have. Then we have rain water, lake water, salt water, and bubble water. Okay, so the control group. What would be the control group if um, we're trying to test which type of water, what would be the normal way plants would grow? And um, we can compare against, it would be like, we would just use no water to see how what plants with no water would grow compared to different types of water. So control group would be one with no water in it at all. Um, the constants, what would we be keeping the same for all of these different samples right here? We have five different samples. What would we keep the same in all of them? Because we're not testing that on the experiment, but we wanna keep them the same because we're only testing one thing. So one thing that we would keep the same is um, the amount of water. We would need to make sure the amount of water is the same for all of our tests. Amount of water. Um, if you look at the pictures, like what do you think we're keeping the same in all of them? Would be maybe the type of soil. Type and amount of soil, I would say. Let's say that type and amount of soil. The type and amount of soil. Um, how much sunlight they're getting. We want to keep that the same for all of them. Um, and we can also add temperature. We want to keep them all in the same temperature. And you know what? A big part is um, type of plant would be, need to be the same. Those are our constants. That's a big one to put down because we want the same kind of plant we want the same amount of water in each one, um, and all the other things kept the same. The only thing we're changing is the independent variable, which is the type of water, but everything else are our constants. We would gather our baseline data against one that had no water. Okay, so let's do one more example of practicing all these parts of an experiment. And this one, I'll give you just a second if someone needs to write something on this page still. All right, example number two. Which substance will melt ice the fastest? So we have a well-defined question because it is a testable question. Our independent variable and our dependent variable we're going to pick out right now. So which substance will melt ice the fastest? Our independent variable would be um, the different substances for melting. So that's our independent variable, different substances for melting. Because that is the one thing we're testing. And the dependent variable is what are we measuring? And what are we measuring? We are measuring how long it takes for the ice to melt.
Of course, you can word that differently. If you can do it shorter, that's fine too. Ice melting. Maybe we just put ice melting. But that is what we're measuring. So that's our dependent variable. Now, we have to have a group that um, will just go through the experiment but not get the independent variable. So we're going to have ice but no substances on it. So ice with no substances. Okay, so just plain ice. That will be our control group. We'll see. We'll have to time how long it just takes ice to melt on its own. Okay, so in this experiment, we got to have a constant. So we got we're testing look, look six different things. Um, so we are. And that's the, they call it the normal one. Sorry, the normal on their pictures. They call it the control group right here. The normal one, just plain with nothing on it. Okay, so the things we're keeping the same is the amount of ice. And I would say how much of the substance, so amount of substance. Those are the constants, the things that we keep the same for each of the experiments. All right. So that's just some practice with our parts of the experiment. And the next thing a scientist would have to work on in process skills is measurement. And um, measurement, of course, crosses over with our math and um, measuring in science. We use the International System of Measurement. It is called the Metric System, as you know. Okay, It's the International System of Measurement, the metric system. We use that to measure in science. All of your numbers and measurements in science must include a metric unit of measurement. We call it no naked numbers. Put some clothes on those numbers. They need to have the unit of measurement so that way we know and everyone else is reading your numbers knows what you measured. Were you measuring mass? Were you measuring length? Were you measuring the temperature and so forth? You though, That unit tells us so much, just like we used with the microscopes. That little X means that you were tells us what kind of magnification you used. So all numbers or measurements must include a metric unit. So just some um, reminder tools that length, we're gonna use the centimeter or with a, a metric ruler, the centimeter or millimeter, and you always start at the zero, which may or may not be the end of the ruler, but you always start in the zero. Volume, a volume um, is in a graduated cylinder. So this is a cylinder. So therefore, when you put liquid or substances in a cylinder, it dips down a little bit. That is going to be called the meniscus. So I'm going to highlight that. I don't know if you can see that. Okay. You read at the meniscus. And the meniscus, let me, let's see if I can get that small, is the bottom of the dip. Okay. So this right here. The bottom of the dip. Do not take a reading at the top of the curve. So the meniscus is the bottom of that dip. Um, so you're going, to, you're going to use milliliters to record a volume. And um, there's also something as you learn, probably water displacement. So if you're measuring an irregular object, such as a marble or a rock, something that's not a cube shape, then you could put it in your, your cylinder and check out the water displacement, which is subtracting the levels of the water rising from the beginning to get your volume. Okay. All right, mass, you're going to use grams. And um, with a digital scale, you have to make sure it's teared, at, that means uh, set at zero. Um, you could also use a triple, we use this more than this digital scale, but triple beam balance. This is a digital scale.
So that's to find out how um, how much um, mass is in an object, which is different than what measuring weight. This is way different. All right, density. Density, you're going to have to find the volume. See, volume and the mass. You're going to do a little bit of math. You're going to calculate, which we will work on in the measurement lab. Um, you're going to calculate to find density. You're going to do mass divided by volume. So you're going to have to find the mass of the object and then divide it by the volume so you can find out your density. And this is this picture is showing you things that are more dense than others. If it's more dense, it's going to be towards the bottom. If it's less dense, it will be on top. So we can actually write that. Less dense up here, more dense at the bottom. Temperature, we use Celsius. Um, it's about reading. We will use these kind of thermometers, not the um, a one that you can use for the digital thermometers. Uh, we'll use more like this. We have to read the red line and make sure you're reading in Celsius. pH. Um, the pH is to determine um, if it's an acid or a base. So we will use a litmus paper, pH paper right here and there is a scale from one zero sorry zero to 14 if it's an acid it will be zero to six if it's something neutral like water it'll be around seven and then a base um, it could be eight to 14 and, and sometimes that word you'll hear it is alkaline um the word base and i use the word base but you'll also see it written as the word alkaline um there are, we have pH probes right here, um, but uh, we have some that are just broken. So we typically will use the pH paper to determine acidity or neutrality or if it's an alkaline base. We will work more with pH later this week. I also involved, um, included this particular reminder about the metric system. I know this is not the first time you've heard of the metric system, but right here, um, this is really important about use these measurements for, for measuring. So if you have length, it will be in the form of meters. It might be centimeters or kilometers, but it will if it's length, it's going to have the word meters in it. Mass will have the word grams in it, so it could be milligrams if it's small or big if it's kilograms. And if it's a medium measurement, it's grams. Volume will have the word liter in it, and temperature will have the word Celsius. How you know if it's a metric unit, it has, it ends with, it has these words in it. If it includes the word um, gallon, I don't know what's gone, it's that, okay. Gallon, or inches, or ounces, or pounds, don't, you don't have to write this down. Um, just listen. It has the word feet or um, those are the ones I'm thinking of first. These are not metric units. Not metric. So we don't use them in science. Fahrenheit, that's also not metric. Let's highlight these right here. These are the metric ones that we will use in science. That's how you recognize it if it is a metric unit. Here's the chart for metric units. So if it's a base unit, that would be the meter, meter, or the gram. It's going to be right here. If it's smaller, see, it's, let me highlight that. Smallest is going to have the prefix of milla. If it's bigger, it's going to have kilo. So it goes from biggest this way to smallest. And this chart will tell you, like, if you're not sure, what does what does a gram feel like? What does um, kilometer look like? This little chart tells you, like, a centimeter is about the radius of a nickel. Um, a kilometer is just over half a mile. Um, a milliliter is about a fourth of a teaspoon. A teaspoon is not metric, so just so you know. Um, a liter is about half of a two liter bottle of soda. And mass is, a gram is like how a dollar bill feels in your hand or one medium paper clip, which is still pretty light. 
Um, but a kilogram is about two pounds. Just so you know what those um, relate to in our um, customized system of measuring in, in America. All right, um, we are pretty much the only country, almost the only country that uses our own measuring system and all of the other countries use an international system of measurement, which is the metric system, the base 10 system, and because they can communicate with other scientists very easily um, and quickly about measurements. So that therefore all the countries have gone to metric system. But we United States have our own customary system, which are these things we marked out. Some of the units right here that that we use we didn't this is not metric all right so you guys make sure all your blanks are filled in if you don't have a blank filled in you can ask a table mate to help you out and if they can't help you out let me know um keep these in your isn your digital notebook for reference you can come back and use again anytime and prepare for the next assessments thank you all bye